This week we're going to talk about five things that everybody needs to know about nerding. As you may know, my name is Charlie and I'm the voice on the other end of the tech support line here at Hobby Wing and often I get asked lots of questions that tend to have nothing to do with Hobby Wing stuff, but is a good thing for all of us to know as new nerds, if you will. So these are going to be five topics that every new nerd should know a little bit about. The big thing that I run into is regarding battery packs. A lot of times I get asked, what can I have too much C rating? Like, what's the maximum C rating that I can have? There's no such thing as too much C rating on a battery pack. Too much voltage, sure, of course. Not too much milliamps, not too much C rating. That's not really a thing. You can have too low of C rating and you can have too low of a milliamp rating that it's gonna cause problems for the battery pack and even for the speed control. But for the most part, when it comes to the C rating, you can't have too much C rating and you always want as much as possible. Minimum C rating on a pack for whatever you're doing is probably gonna be at least 70 C. I have some 50 C packs here and these are just used for testing and basics. These shut down all the time if I run them real hard. So when I want to go have a good time, I put my good 100 C packs in and make sure that I got enough battery for the setup. And that applies to even the most basic stuff other than maybe rock crawlers. Rock crawler stuff, a lot of times the 50 C is okay. Item number two is gearing. And I get asked all the time, what's the best gear ratio to run? What can I do for max speed? There's two gears on any vehicle, one on the motor, that's called your pinion gear. That's the little one that goes on the motor. And there's the big one, the spur gear that's on on the vehicle's drivetrain. This is like a transmission out of a two-wheel. There's Proline Pro 2 transmission. But for the most part, you always want, if you don't know the gearing, the simple way that I tell everybody the same thing is start out with like a 13 or a 14 tooth pinion gear. Doesn't matter what kind of car you have, for the most part, a 13 or a 14 tooth should be fairly safe no matter what size the spur gear is. And that way, you just got one thing to worry about, starting out with your smallest pinion gear and kind of working your way up safely. You can't be under geared when it comes to the size of the pinion. I mean, you can't run too small, but it's very easy to run too large of a pinion gear and run into to problems. Um, gearing is another one of those things where you kind of have to have a lot of gears to work with so you can fine tune things. If temperatures changes or running condition changes or whatever the case may be, you want to be able to change gears and set gear mesh correctly and do all that fun stuff so that you're, you're not doing it wrong, so to speak. Once you get a gear sorted out, you can kind of leave it that way or drop down a tooth or two to it to be safe. Item number three, plugs, plugs, and more plugs. I talk about plugs probably more than I should because plugs cause me a lot of grief. When you are looking into what plugs to get, there's a couple things to consider. The plug itself should be bigger than the wire that you're working with, otherwise they're gonna let you down. I cannot really use Dean's plugs. I cannot use the uh, Traxxas plugs. I can't really use any adapters on any of my setups. This is one of those XT60s, the Traxxas adapters. Um, and even just regular Traxxas plugs and a lot of those EC plugs where the, the wire is floating inside of some tubes. These XT style plugs, there's no tube to solder to. It's a uh, it's a flat surface or a cup, if you will. So it makes it real easy to get your wires down on those tabs. Even if you have a professional solder up a set of those tube style EC plugs for you, they can be a little bit problematic because there's no way to get the wire to touch to the metal surface. Solder is a bad conductor, so you don't want your wires floating in solder when you're doing solder joints and stuff like that. For most of the high power stuff these days, this is an XT90. It's a pretty big size. This is what was real common for a while, they're XT60s. But for the bigger power stuff, we're starting to see a lot more folks using these for pretty much everything. It's nice to not have to worry about your plug overheating and they're easy to get a hold of. There's even a bigger size, the XT150 and beyond. These are, these are fantastic if you're doing high horsepower stuff. But for the most part, you're gonna have to, the good plugs go hand in hand with the good battery packs. When you run into shutdowns, a lot of times it's low C rating and bad plugs. Plug, so you get a super bad deal. Sometimes you can go to a little bit better plug and get away with it. Sometimes you can go to a better battery and get away with it and keep your old plugs. But for the most part, do yourself a favor, get down on some better plugs. The brand that I like the most are these S or a mass brand XT series. They do an XT 60 and an XT 90, which are real common. My favorite one that I run into on a regular basis is what I call the dual voltage phenomenon. Item number four, is dual voltage setups are not really a thing. There are lots of setups that are advertised that work on 2S or 3S, 3S and 4S, 4S to 6S, stuff like that. Your speed control is gonna have a rating for a voltage range, 3S to 
8S. And then the motor that you use it with really determines what voltage you're going to use. Because I have an 8S speed control, doesn't mean I can take this 3S motor and run it on 8S. That's just not going to be a good time. So you got to take both things into effect or into, into factor in here. For the most part, a good setup that'll run awesome on two cell is probably going to overheat on three cell. Or if it runs good on three cell, it's going to be a little bit boring on two cell. And the same is true of three and four cell, that, that same phenomenon. More so when you go from a three cell motor to a four cell motor, most Three cell motors are the 3660 size motors. The uh, Most of the three cell setups are gonna be the 3660 size motor and they're too small for the 4S. And then a 4S motor is the 42 series motor, which is kind of too big for 3S. So in my personal opinion, I don't think there's such thing as dual voltage systems. Sure, it can function and it can be workable, but you're gonna run into problems where the higher voltage likes to overheat or the lower voltage uh, is a little bit kind of boring, which I mean, is doable for some. You, when you drive it, it's on your higher voltage stuff. When you let your friends drive it, it's on your lower voltage stuff. But keep that in mind when you're looking for voltage and range and stuff like that. Um, also, a quick thing on KV and voltage. Um, for 3S setups, you want to be below 4,000 KV on the motor for the most part. For two cell setups, you can go 4,000 KV and higher without too much to worry about. So, And then for four cell setups... And six cell setups, you're going to be 1,900 to 2,200 kV, but the big deal is they're those larger size 42 series motors. Item number five, lipo care, safety, and conditions. Now, this is a big one that's near and dear to my heart. I have had more than a few people have problems with battery packs over the years. I have a collection of old battery packs that I won't use anymore because they're kind of risky. If you're not familiar with all that lipo care, storage, conditions, and all that, this is a brief breakdown of that. You never want to store it fully dead. You never want to store it fully charged. You never want to store them in cold conditions and or hot conditions. And those are all going to affect the lifespan of the battery pack. Now, charge your battery packs up. You go out to use them. You don't have any time to drive your RC. You're going to let them sit charged for a while. It's really bad for the battery packs and it's extra dangerous. You want to try to put those on your charger and get them back to storage mode or at least drive the cars around slowly, bring, you know, give or take a third to half of the charge out of the battery pack. You want to store your battery packs between like probably 3.7 to 3.8 volts per cell so they store well and they don't kind of deteriorate over time. Um, the hot and cold conditions apply to the same. If it's winter time or if the garage is very cold, you're going to notice that the voltage in the battery packs is going to be weaker, even though it measures the same. And this stems from how the battery packs react to those temperatures. So if it's hot outside, your battery packs will run a little harder than if it's cold outside. And sometimes if the battery pack is very cold after you run it for a little while and it warms up, they actually get a little bit better and run stronger. So the, the temperature will affect the battery packs as well. And the big thing with safety is, you can mind your P's, you can dot your T's, you can cross your I's, you can do whatever you want, but lipos should be treated with a lot of respect and be very thorough with your safety. Store them in fireproof containers, charge them while you're in the same room with them so that if something goes wrong, you can get them out. Be prepared with some sort of lipo safety so that with these things do, God forbid, catch on fire, you don't have to just stand there and watch it burn. You can throw it into a box, get a bucket of sand, have some oven mitts, something so that you can try to mitigate the situation. And the biggest thing about that with lipos is just charging a designated charging area that you know is set up for this. Build yourself a brick area beside your garage or on the floor of your workbench or on the top of your workbench, something so that you have a designated area where you're always keeping track of your lipos. There's not a bunch of stuff flopping around getting stored with your lipos or anything like that. And you can very easily you know, check voltage but just a quick recap on our five pro tips for nerd noobs. Uh, there's no such thing as too much C rating. You want probably at least a minimum of 50 C rating. Uh, when it comes to gearing, always, 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 if you don't know how to gear it, start out with a small pinion gear and work your way up. Like I said, 13 or 14 is safe. Uh, when it comes to plugs, more is better. Uh, you want to go away from like the Dean's plugs. You want to go away from the, the Traxxas plugs. You want to go away from the adapters and stick to a good high quality plug that doesn't have a tube when you solder the wire to it. So I'm a big fan of these AMAS brand XTs. They're good and affordable. Like I mentioned, there's a, I don't think there's a such thing as a dual voltage setup. It's going to run very good on one voltage and either be too hot on a higher voltage or not very entertaining on a lower voltage. So keep that in mind when you're doing your shopping. And the 
mind your P's and your Q's on your LiPo safety. They are very, very dangerous devices and you should respect them for what they are. Uh, one that I always like to mention with these pl batteries with the bullet plugs, I, d I try to leave these in here because you'll wear the bullet in the battery out. So the longer you can leave these guys plugged in there, the longer the battery pack terminals are gonna last. So that's another kind of 5.5 pro tip there. But that's it everybody. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for making it this far. Our number six bonus tip for you, power caps on speed controls. More is usually better. But if a speed control has power caps on it, definitely don't remove them. If you wanted to add power caps on it, make sure you get the right kind that are recommended for the speed control. Just putting caps on a speed control willy-nilly can be a little problematic. But if you do have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to shoot us an email, hobbywing.com. If there's something that you want us to talk about or be addressed, you can leave it in a comment down below. I try to read all the comments. I don't get to answer hardly any of them, um, but we do try to bring that stuff up. So we thank you guys for all being part of the Charlie Show, new every Tuesday.